it's a tax department. Okay. 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 I take checks if you let me. This is my friend and fellow partner in crime, uh, Larry Gibson. Let's give Larry a big hand. <laughs> Larry and I uh, worked together for how many years? Oh, 20 maybe, a little over 20. Anyway, uh, he has, you still have 50 acres? Sure. 50 acres of property up on Hayford Mountain, and we're both uh, fighting to see if we can stop mountaintop removal, which has devastated uh, the people in the valleys. It's the people that I'm concerned about, not just the scenery. We love the mountains, and West Virginia is the mountain state. But at the same time, the, the damage is done to the people who have all these rocks and trees and soil dumped over the side of the mountain into their front yards. People who have water wells who frequently find those water wells have gone dry because the blasting has affected the aquifers. And uh, people have visited Larry's Kayford Mountain from all over the world, as far away as Australia. And uh, I also want to put in a pitch for the preservation of Blair Mountain, where in 1921 occurred the greatest land battle since the Civil War. And Blair Mountain was threatened by strip mining and mountaintop removal. And we're all working together to try to save this historic site. Despite the fact that somebody here in this capital said it was just a frivolous operation for us to try to do that, I'm a great student of history. I not only studied history, I got my PhD in history from Columbia University one of the outstanding history departments in this nation. And uh, I get up every morning and uh, start to write because I would get a lot of things off my chest before I kick the bucket. <laughs> Can y'all hear him pretty good? Everybody hear him pretty good? We'll move the microphone a little closer yeah. to him here. Uh, we'll get started here probably with the formal presentation in about 10 minutes. We'll give a few more people time to get here. Then I'll introduce uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Heckler here very shortly. You'll push me off the diving board? No, we won't do that. <laughs> we'll let you continue to talk, though. Everybody wants to hear you. So uh, I'll introduce you, though, here. You know. Well, anybody who doesn't want to hear me can uh, get up and walk out. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
I have just completed a book and it's going to be published in two volumes in August. Right after the end of World War II, when I was in Europe, I had the opportunity to interrogate the number two man to Adolf Hitler, Hermann Goering. And I not only interviewed him, but I interviewed a whole bunch of uh, Nazis that were captured. And uh, as I say, I've completed the manuscript and it's now being edited and will be probably out in August. 1,200 pages, wow. I might have to raise the price from $20 to $30 because it certainly cost a great deal to print a book of that size. And uh, so I got a lot of other books I want to get off my chest too. But uh, incidentally, since we're going to wait a few minutes for people to come in, if anybody wants to shoot a question at me about anything under the sun or between here and the moon, uh, let me know. Uh, so you can speak German? I, I had to, in order to get a PhD, you have to be able to read German, two foreign languages, I took French and German, and uh, I don't trust my German in interrogation, so I had an interpreter who was a real genius, a young man who had been born in Vienna, and uh, he was so good that he could take my questions in English, translate them into German to shoot them at the people I was interrogating, interpret the answers, and then write them down in English, which was a fascinating uh, achievement. This young man was so good that even though he was only a sergeant in the U.S. Army, he's now uh, teaching in a law school of, at the University of London. He's that good. So. Uh, I had to lean on him in order to make sure that the questions were accurate and the answers were accurate. These will all be published in this 1,200 page book coming out in August. Anybody else want to shoot a question at me? I want to know how come you haven't been swimming Well, I had an operation on my hip. I had a new, got a new hip. And, uh, also, uh, I woke up a couple of months ago and I began to see double out of my right eye and my left eye. You notice I keep my right eye close so I can see one thing. That's why I haven't been up at the YSCA lately. Tell my friends I miss them. That's right. I miss you too. <laughs> How many books have you published overall? 
about 12, I guess, uh, the most popular uh, held up Bridget Ramagan. The Bridge of Remagen, uh, they made a movie out of. That's, that's a very important uh, event that occurred on the 7th of March, 1945. Hitler had ordered all the bridges up and down the Rhine blown up as we approached. But this last bridge at the little town of Remagen, which is about the size of Nitro, was uh, still standing because the Germans were trying to retreat some of their big tanks and artillery before we could capture them. And uh, when the first troops crossed the bridge, the Germans tried to blow it up. I was not physically there, I was about 10 miles back, but of course I hightailed it down to Remagen to interview both the Americans and the Germans that had been involved in this action. And uh, on both sides they all testified that when the explosion went off, the bridge seemed to lift up from its foundations and then settled back very shakily. While it was still shaking, the first Americans dashed across. Meanwhile, some armored engineers were busy uh, cutting the cables that uh, would still have blown up the bridge had they been allowed to Stay there. There were 13 Distinguished Service Crosses awarded. Distinguished Service Cross is the second highest decoration the Army could give, second only to the Medal of Honor, which West Virginia's Woody Williams uh, won at the Battle of. Iwo Jima in the Far East. Wherever Woody Williams appears, the audience reveres him and will give him a standing ovation. But that put the bridge at Remagen uh, sold 650,000 copies, but as you probably know, there was a full-length motion picture made out of it by the same name. We had a pretty good cast. Uh, Robert Vaughn, the man from UNCLE that you may remember from television, played a German officer. And uh, Ben Gazzara and George Siegel were key actors in that movie. Of course, that movie uh, helped the sale of the book, and uh, that's the only book I've written which uh, was made into a movie. But I have to confess to you that Hollywood has its own ideas of the truth, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't want you to believe everything you see in that movie. Uh, for example, their very first scene in the movie has tanks barreling across the landscape about 60 miles an hour. I was supposed to be the technical advisor, so I said, you know, that's wrong, and combat tanks can't go more than 12 miles an hour. But the producer said, yeah, but this is so much more dramatic. <laughs> and on the 7th of March, 1945, I didn't see any women around the bridge, but uh, of course Hollywood had to introduce 
So, uh, to bring a love story into it. Well, I think we'll go ahead and uh, start tonight's program. Um, there may be a few more people that come in, but it's a great honor and a great privilege to be able to uh, introduce one of our state's leading statesmen of all time, and uh, he has been around in politics for a lot of years. He uh, has served as Secretary of State 16 years, and I think he was 18 years in Congress as a representative from West Virginia. As you've learned, he's a great writer, publisher, and I tell you what, in my 34 years of being here at the West Virginia State Archives, he is one of our loyal and regular patrons to this day. He comes in and uses books in this library that I don't even know hardly how anybody would know how to use them. The congressional records. But he knows exactly what volumes he wants and all the information from it. So uh, he is going to do a presentation tonight on the Civil War. His grandfather fought in the Civil War, and he's going to discuss this book this evening, and it's Soldier of the Union. And with great pleasure, I would like to formally introduce tonight's Genealogy Club speaker, Ken Hackler. Thank you very much. Um, I think the uh, best description I can give of this book is the excellent review which Rick Steelhammer wrote in the Charleston Gazette. In the year 1854, my great-grandfather whose name is George Gottfried Heckler, sold his possessions over in Germany, where he grew up in a small town uh, near Heidelberg. His twin sister had already come to this country and sent back glowing reports of how friendly the people were in the town of Marietta, Ohio, which is on the Ohio River, right opposite Parkersburg. And so this is exactly where my great-grandfather and his big family migrated to in 1854, when my grandfather was only 14 years old. After the uh, Union defeat at the first battle of Bull Run, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers. And my grandfather and his younger brother, John, whose pictures are on the front of Soldier of the Union, crossed the Ohio River into Parkersburg to enlist. So I think my best introduction will be simply to read from Rick Steelheimer's excellent review. He writes, in September of 1861,
In September of 1861, 20-year-old George Heckler left his family's farm, crossed the Ohio River, and enlisted in the 36th Ohio Volunteer Infantry at its encampment in Parkersburg. For the next four years, the German-born enlisted enlistee took part in some of Civil War's bloodiest battles. His vivid description of a soldier's life, captured in letters to his favorite sister, Kate, formed the backbone of Soldier of the Union. Now, my grandfather's mother died when he was only six years old. And uh, his older sister, Kate, was a substitute to mother and helped rear my grandfather. And that's why he wrote all of these letters to Kate. The book is published by Pictorial Histories Publishing Company. They have an office with the West Virginia Book Company here in Charleston. But their main office is in Missoula, Montana, run by a West Virginian named Stan Cohen, who uh, grew up in Charleston, but he loves to ski, so that's why he moved out to Montana so he could <coughs> conduct his business as well as being able to ski. My grandfather willed the letters to my dad and he willed them to me, said former Congressman and Secretary of State Ken Heckler, George Heckler's grandson. Quote, when I was in Congress, Parkersburg was in my district, and some of the letters were in a series I wrote for the Parkersburg News. This book contains a very complete set of everything my grandfather wrote about his experiences in the military, from the time he enlisted in Parkersburg to when he was discharged up in Wheeling in 1865. George Heckler's letters to his sister begin one day after he crossed the Ohio River on the steamer Daniel Webster to enlist in the U.S. Army at Camp Union, attendant campment in an oak grove alongside the Staunton Parkersburg Turnpike. Quote, the same evening I started for Marietta, I came into camp and enrolled my name, Heckler wrote, and well it was, for there were no more than 14 boys came down to join Captain Palmer's company, which was just the number required to fill it, so we have the only full company in our regiment. The new private wrote that he could not report much about his reaction to military life, quote, as I have only been here one day, but I think I shall like it first rate. His younger brother John had enlisted in the same company of 36 Ohio Volunteer Infantry one month earlier and had already been involved in skirmishes with secessionist bushwhackers in the Spencer area. That's Roan County, of course. The regiment was led by Indian fighter George Crook, a colonel at the beginning of the war and a major general later. The Heckler brothers were reunited during the winter of 1861 at Summersville. That's the county seat of Nicholas County, where Commander Crook had ordered his troops turn that to 7B, to build a 800 foot long shed.
rather to train. And they trained uh, in this drill shed for five to seven hours a day. And by the end of the winter, the soldiers were fit, disciplined, and tired of camp life. He got his first taste of battle on May 23rd, the Battle of Lewisburg, West Virginia. After having marched at double quick pace through the fog shrouded town, shortly after daybreak, Heckler's company encountered what they thought were Union pickets, but they were actually Confederate troops who immediately fired on the Union soldiers. We were ordered to lie down until two sharp valleys were sent over us, some of them disagreeably close to our heads, throwing up dirt around us, Heckler wrote. The Confederates stopped firing, thinking they had us all killed. But what was then their surprise when we all stood up and commenced firing? And he goes on to say that uh, they attacked a group of Confederates that were, had never lost a battle. And even though they had less men than did the Confederate army, the Union soldiers won that battle and the Confederates retreated in confusion, leaving behind cartridge belts, guns, horses, sacks with a little ration in some, biscuits, canteens, overcoats, blankets, pants, vests, shorts, and other articles strewn about the road. In August of 36, Ohio marched back to the Kanawha Valley, stopping to swim and bathe in the Kanawha River near Bell, where the DuPont plant is now situated. In those days, the river was pretty clean and it was, <laughs> it was pretty easy to, to uh, bathe and swim in the Kanawha River. After a brief furlough, Eckler and his comrades boarded rail cars and rode the width of present-day West Virginia, passing through Harper's Ferry and into Washington, D.C., where they glimpsed the unfinished Washington Monument. After taking part in the Union defeat at the Second Battle of Bull Run, the regiment fell back to Arlington, Virginia, and camped on the lawn of the Robert E. Lee homestead. President Abraham Lincoln and Francis Pierpont, governor of the restored government of Virginia, looked on as the 36th Ohio marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in September 19, 1862 and stopped for a break under the shade trees next to the White House from there, the regiment fought at Frederick, South Mountain, and Bloody Antietam in Maryland. The battle-hardened unit returned to Parkersburg by rail, and then traveled by riverboat to Red House in Putnam County, and marched to winter, quarter, winter quarters along the Elk River in Charleston. We have good quarters here in Charleston, and all are found are fixed up well, Eckler commented to his sister in January 1863. The mud is getting very deep around here in camp, and the roads are getting very bad in West Virginia. Well, as you know, that's nothing new. <laughs> 
When the weather broke, the 36 Ohio once more boarded steamboats, this time traveled west to Nashville. The regiment suffered heavy losses when after being cut off from other Union forces, its charge through enemy lines during the Battle of Chickamauga. And at Chickamauga, uh, my great uncle, John Heckler, was captured and sent to the infamous uh, Confederate prison in Andersonville, where along with 30,000 other Union prisoners died at Andersonville. And uh, that pretty much uh, summarizes uh, what's in this book. I'll be glad to uh, try to answer any questions that anybody has about either the book or about any of the other of my uh, multifarious activities. That I've got mixed up in. Ken, you had mentioned uh, talking to your grandfather who had served in the Civil War. Um, had he, was that a life changing event for him that he spoke of, or was he reluctant to speak of his, his events? Well, I was 14 years old when my grandfather died. and. <laughs> I visited him many times, and unfortunately, uh, he was pretty reticent, as many people are, about their military activity. But it's pretty obvious to me, and you can garner this from, by reading the book, that uh, the Army uh, was a joyful experience for him. He fit in very well with uh, the kind of activity, and he really respected uh, General Crook, his commanding officer, not only for his experience, but because of his leadership ability. And uh, after the war, um, my grandfather moved out to uh, Missouri where he became a highly successful farmer and uh, made a lot of money farming, which all farmers don't do. Growing corn and soybeans and uh, marketable crops. But to answer your question, uh, this seemed to fit in with uh, his idea of a wonderful life. And you'll see when you read the letters uh, that he paid a great deal of attention to military details in describing his experience. That's what makes, makes these letters so useful as a description of what happened during the Civil War. And, uh, it's sort of like uh, the reaction of a Boy Scout going to camp. Uh, he really uh, got a great kick out of uh, everything. And, uh, so to your answer to your question, uh, this fit in very well with uh, his idea of how to spend time. Uh, and of course, like many of the soldiers of the Union, uh, they uh, developed a great respect for President Lincoln. And after the war was over, he joined the 
G.A.R., the Grand Army of the Republic, and uh, he was a pivotal speaker at uh, many of the G.A.R. reunions. Unlike myself, who I'm a, who is a Democrat, way, uh, he used to say, "Vote the way you shot in the Civil War," and uh, so. He remained a very, very strong supporter of the Republican Party all through his life. And he was a leader in uh, education. He had three sons, all of whom he was able to put through the University of Missouri. One of the three was my father. And he uh, was president of his Board of Education in the county in which he grew up in Missouri. But he always expressed pride in uh, what he was able to achieve during the Civil War. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Anybody else? You said the hecklers came to, to uh, Marietta in the 1850s? Uh, you said that the hecklers came to there in the 1850s. Yeah, well, 1850s, yes. 1850s. Is that right? Did the hecklers come to the area in the 1850s? Yes, they came there in uh, 1854. The follow up to that then is were they citizens of the United States? when the war broke out and when they enlisted in the Army? Excuse me. Can you, can you talk a little louder? At this age, first thing that goes is hearing. Uh, I'm a little bit hard of hearing, but... Yeah, I'm not going to be hearing. What did you say? Ken, Dr. Hecker, the question was, were they citizens of the United States when the war broke out? They had come from Germany, and they, and they achieved American citizenship uh, when the war started and when they enlisted into the Army. He never had any problem with uh, his American citizenship, uh, and uh, I'm not sure of the details, but I think it's, uh, he was uh, officially sworn in as a citizen uh, uh, shortly after the end of the Civil War in 1865. And, uh, of course, he had to pass the regular naturalization uh, examinations that all new citizens had to take. But officially, he did not become a citizen until 1865. But it didn't hurt his application for citizenship to have served in the Union Army. Now, if he had served in the Confederate Army, he would have had a lot of trouble, as you know. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did, yeah. Anybody else? Well, yeah. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of guerrilla warfare in West Virginia during the Civil War. Did he write about this much in, in, in the letters home, about the, the guerrilla warfare uh, between the Confederates and the Union forces? He understands there was a lot of guerrilla warfare in West Virginia between the Confederates and the Union. Did your uh, grandfather write about that? Yes, although my great uncle was, was probably more exposed to the guerrilla warfare, they called the uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, Confederate uh, supporters who were not in the, actually in the Army. They were nicknamed Bushwhackers. And they would uh, do what the uh, French Resistance used to do over in France uh, uh, to helped the uh, Allied cause, and they did everything they 
could to try to embarrass the uh, Union forces and to slow them down. Uh, so uh, that is very true that there was a lot of guerrilla warfare going on. And uh, nevertheless, uh, my grandfather concentrated in his letters on the major battles like uh, Antietam and Lewisburg and uh, Chickamauga. Uh, he concentrated on these big battles because uh, those were the ones that the, the people were interested in. And uh, his letters are, are very graphic in their description of these battles. From a uh, viewpoint of a but private, he was wounded at Antietam, and after the Battle of Antietam, he was promoted from private to corporal, and he served the rest of the war as Corporal George Heckler. But to answer your question, he did not concentrate as much on the guerrilla warfare as, as in the major pitch battles which uh, the 36th Ohio Volunteer Infantry participated in. But they were right in the eye of the hurricane. And uh, this is what makes these letters so valuable. I am really not a... Approximately how many letters? I would say, uh, I didn't add them all up, but I'd say they're uh, probably about 200 altogether. Say that again. Would he have been 16 years old when he was captured? Wounded? Would he have been 16 years old when he was captured? Well, it was my great uncle that was captured, oh, okay. rather than my grandfather. And uh, he would uh, probably be about 20 when he was captured. And he was captured. Uh, in the latter stages of the Civil War. Did he survive? Huh? Did his brother survive the war? Did, did he survive the war? He made a statement about COVID. He, not, he, he went to Antenna, but he didn't survive, and 38,000 people died in prison with him. Is that what you said? That's my great uncle, not my grandfather. Yeah. Uh, no, he died in Andersonville Prison, and uh, <clears throat> he died, uh, the cause of his death was uh, that he wasn't getting any vitamin C, which uh, is provided in citrus fruits and tomatoes, which were not served in the <laughs> prison ration in Andersonville. And the, the head of the Andersonville prison, as you probably know, was hanged uh, after the end of the war. I think justifiably, because he almost deliberately uh, uh, starved the prisoners. Talk about his brother and his death? 
Did your grandfather actually say anything or write about you or his brother in that? In other words, did he write about his brother that died in the recruiting camp? I think uh, he did write about the fact that uh, uh, his younger brother was allowed to write one letter, that's before he became sick, and uh, he was always hoping that along with a lot of other Union prisoners that he could be exchanged. There were some very lucky Union prisoners that were exchanged along with the freeing of uh, Confederate prisoners at the Union prisons. And uh, he just didn't have enough influence uh, to uh, make that exchange, even though he tried. But, uh, of course, it was a terrible blow to him when, not only when his younger brother was captured, but particularly when he was sent uh, to Andersonville because the stories out of Andersonville indicated that very few Union prisoners were able to survive. They weren't given enough water or other liquids to drink, and uh, there was a very polluted creek that ran through the camp, which uh, in desperation a lot of people would take a drink out of, and of course that was very fatal. Yes. Do, do the family members know where this the soldier that died in Andersonville, do they know where his body is? Do the family members know where your grandfather's body is? Did they, did they retrieve the body? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, there's a uh, federally financed uh, um, group. Uh, now that has uh, taken charge of uh, the Andersonville grounds and they have given a decent burial with headstones so that uh, you can actually uh, visit. I have not personally visited but I've, I've, I have a picture of the very attractive headstone that was put up for my great uncle. And uh, that is a congressionally financed uh, group that is working to preserve the uh, memory of those who died at Andersonville. And so uh, my grandfather himself was always very reluctant to uh, talk about it because it was so painful for him to realize that uh, this is what had happened. Uh, at Chickamauga, the, uh, a large number of members of the unit, the Ohio Volunteer Infantry, were surrounded in such a way that they could not fight their way out and so they were forced to get captured. But uh, I think uh, the members of the family, to answer your question, uh, uh, 
we're not really a party to this uh, recent restoration of uh, Andersonville, which is done now by a federally financed uh, outfit that is, was created by Act of Congress. Each of these people are uh, regarded as heroes by those that administer this restoration of Andersonville. Yes. How are the how do you have the letters preserved? How do you have the letters preserved? Uh, the original letters uh, are in the uh, special collections at Marshall University where all my papers are. The originals and then from the originals uh, they've uh, they typed copies, so it's very easy for you to read them. The uh, letters themselves, when first written, were were written uh, pretty roughly. In one of them, uh, my grandfather descri describes the way in which they made ink out of uh, Pokeberry juice and brown sugar, and uh, so uh, it took some expertise to uh, make sure that the typed version of those letters is available. And uh, if you go to Marshall University in Huntington in the Special Collections Department, which is in the old Morrow Library before the new Drinko Library was built at Marshall. Uh, they will show you the, not only the original letters that are hard to read, but also the typed versions, which are, uh, of course, the ones that I used in terms of writing this book. But they're all accessible, and uh, there's nothing secret about them. They're all available in case you want to uh, look at them. And uh, I've always wanted to write this book, uh, but there's been a long delay as I I finally got a lot of pressure from uh, my cousins who are related to... It's very interesting that um, when they crossed the Atlantic, uh, that was a very dangerous voyage back in 1854. It took about seven weeks from the port of embarkation in Le Havre, France, to fight uh, in a sailing vessel where sometimes they say the waves were as high as a house. And it's amazing that uh, so many people uh, that came to this country from other countries were able to, to survive that trip. I'm very grateful for the fact that uh, they were. And uh, one of my cousins who lives in Bethesda has actually has the trunk that my grandfather used to put all of his family's clothes in, as well as uh, dried uh, fruits and other things 
material for baking bread aboard ship because in those days they didn't have state rooms, state rooms and <laughs> places where you could sit at the captain's table <laughs> and uh, get a wonderful uh, meal. But that truck is uh, a real prize that uh, my cousin has and uh, I think I have a picture of it in my book. Uh, So it was a pretty stormy trip that they came over on. Thank goodness they survived because I, I wouldn't be here if they hadn't. I just want to say if uh, if uh, I'll be glad to autograph any of these books that you want and here's a big bargain for five dollars. Uh, where's the boss? I would like to thank you all for coming out tonight and uh, hearing this wonderful presentation from a great historian, and it's been a pleasure to have him here. I think this deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much.